In one of my favorite manga of all time, Gimmick, a conversation gets had that I think about a lot. The main character, Kohei Nagase, is a VFX artist trying to stop a series of bombings by another artist that had been scorned for his monsters being just... gross. It goes like this. Whoever made these didn't know what he was doing. The dummies aren't scary. They're disgusting. Fear and revulsion aren't the same thing. Only a hack would confuse the two. That's something I've tried to keep in mind while working on my own horror projects over the years. Is what I'm making scary, or is it just gross? It's helped keep me in line while writing things like CSA, body horror, child death, all sorts of twisted and horrible things. Am I making this scary, or am I relying on the revulsion to do the work for me? Well, I can tell you which one Urban Spook is doing, that's for sure. Hello there, my lovely legionnaires. It's time for me to use my commentary muscles to talk about something that grates on me regularly. Ethics and horror! Hooray! This is gonna be a long-ass video, and I'm not gonna be nice for, well, a variety of reasons. We're matching energy today, my lovely legionnaires. Those of you who are looking at the title and going, Heaton, what the hell is Urban Spook? I'll give you a quick rundown. Urban Spook is, allegedly, an analog horror series made by the creator Urban Slug. It's about two serial killers who brutally slaughter innocent people, then paint their bodies. That's about it. That's all we've got after 8 episodes out of 10. Poggers, love that for us. We'll start this video proper with a story summary to make sure that my lovely legionnaires will be able to keep up without having to give Urban Spook a view. And that's gonna go by quick, because all this series really boils down to is purple prose soaked in corn syrup and red dye 40. That's... Yeah, that's it. By the way, real quick, if our lovely editor could put some content warnings up on screen here... Actually, if you want to skip the story summary, can we get a timestamp here too? I'd appreciate that immensely, just the content warnings in the timestamp. I want to give you some time to soak that in, given the X amount of minutes that you will be watching this video. Yeah. Are we ready? Let's -a go! We're cops! We're cops! We're cops! We're cops! Okay, episode one, Faces. Six months ago, cops in city find three paintings after three murders. Yet, yeah, we never get a name for where the place is, so I guess we're just in the fucking back rooms, I guess. Carla Gray is stabbed 36 times and has all of her teeth pulled out. Jackie Graham is drowned and stabbed 27 times in the taint. James Miller gets his face torn off and his wrists cut. Supposedly, he lived for a few days without a face, which... Sure. I guess. Two months later, they find a bunch more paintings. You don't need to give a shit about these right now, and quite frankly, I don't know why we should, since we don't see most of these victims later anyway, and front-loading all of this was stupid. Oh, sorry, I'm doing it again. I'm jumping the gun. Uh, yeah, we find a self-portrait of the painters. I'm shipsing! <laughs> Four weeks ago, from four weeks ago, from six months ago, we get our next murders. The officer who found the paintings, Bill Collins, and his whole family disappear. Two-month-old Angel Collins is hanged from the ceiling. Great. A random teenage kid named Daniel Williams is burned to death. A random woman named Jennifer White and her daughter Lisa are just... dead. Kind of shocked he didn't go for them ripped in half by a taffy puller or what the hell ever, but I'll take it, I guess. And finally, the Collins family are given amphetamine and then... liquefied. They don't explain how, just they're a fine meat slurry now. There's another picture of the killer, whatever. Episode 3 in the walls! You have just made your last mistake. Oh god! Ten days ago, from four weeks ago, from two months later, from six months ago, the Beck twins, Corey and Margaret, both 11, remember that, Go missing. Five days later, from ten days ago, from four weeks ago, from two months later, from six months ago, their bodies are found. They are cut in half, sewn together at the waist, Margaret on top, Corey on the bottom. Margaret died from a brick with the word meat written on it being shoved into her mouth so hard it broke her neck. Corey had his dick ripped off. Oh, yeah. Painting was titled that, huh? Say, how old were they again? Eleven? Dope. Moving on, uh, I guess Corey caught a picture of the killer one week before ten days ago, from four weeks ago, from two months later, from six months ago. Uh, that might have been why. I don't know. Episode 4, The Clue. At some undisclosed time after ten days ago, from four weeks ago, from two months later, from six months ago, Tom Harris is found suffocated after being totally encased in candle wax after the killers climbed up a drain pipe into his third floor apartment with his eyelids and arms removed, and a third mystery arm encased with him. 
All right, then one week after some undisclosed time, after 10 days ago, from four weeks ago, from two months later, from six months ago, the investigator who found Tom, Sean Kane, goes missing, and an undetermined time after that, the body is found inside his home. His dog's legs had all been broken because God forbid we have any decency after the CSA, but the dog is alive, which is refreshing. This pattern will not continue. Wonder where that restraint went. Sean wrote number two in his own blood, the camera caught the killer, given his painting's title, he's probably soup, I don't know. Episode five, The Witness. Three days ago from one week after some undisclosed time, after ten days ago from four weeks ago from two months later from six months ago, Tina Rosenberg, Flora Rosenberg, and Jack Stryker are reported missing. One day after three days ago from one week after some undisclosed time, after ten days ago from four weeks ago from two months later from six months ago, police find Jack's car and the bodies. Tina is somehow still alive, despite her feet being removed and her arms tied to a tree. Flora's head is caved in with a sledgehammer, and Jack is also voided like Sean because Slug ran out of ideas. We get a police sketch of the killer, episode 6, Pigs. <sighs> okay. We ready? Here's where shit hits the fan. Recently, from one day after three days ago, from one week after some undisclosed time, after ten days ago, from four weeks ago, from two months later, from six months ago, former officer Ian Ford and his wife May go missing and their bodies are then found in their barn. May has been... Handcuffed to a pole and raped to death by a horse, the struggle of which resulted in her tearing her own hands off. Fucking okay. God damn it, the horse died from a Viagra induced heart attack because why not? Fiona, the Ford's granddaughter that is introduced into this scene as abruptly as I've written it in the script, was found decapitated in a blanket next to a bloody mattress covered in Viagra. Fuck, god damn it, her eyes are removed. We don't want to think about it. Never mind. We just keep going. The faces of previous victims are found nailed to a wall. Several pigs are decapitated. Ian Ford is found stuffed into the guts of one of the pigs whose eyes have been replaced with Fiona's. Sure. Fine. They find a back room with the rest of Fiona's body, several more paintings that'll be relevant later, and a tape with the killer doing the spooky face. Episode 7, Family. God fucking damn it, son of a bitch, how does it get worse? Over the past few days, after an indeterminate time, after recently, after one day, there are more gruesome murder reports. Who could've possibly guessed? In a random house, Janice's last name has her fetus cut out of her and is then strangled to death with her own umbilical cord. Her husband, Paul, has his mouth sewn shut after being tied to the kitchen counter and was killed by having the baby's head stuffed down his throat. The baby is cut into pieces and scattered all over for... <laughs> Zeke is missing, so I'm sure we'll find him brutally violated at some point. They find a random painting. Isabel Jackson, the person who called the cops and led them to that house instead of her own for whatever motherfucking reason, has a hole drilled into her head. Her husband is stabbed seven times and decapitated. A weird riddle is put in Isabel's new head hole. Footprints are found. Episode 8, Meet, the most current video as of scripting. Over the past week, after an unspecified amount of time, over the past few days, an indeterminate time, after recently, after one day, after three days ago, from one week, after some undisclosed time, after ten days ago, from four weeks ago, from two months later, from six months ago, more people are dead. Shocker. You can't escape me! Dr. Fred Baker has had the skit on his head sandpapered off, his cat is missing, but given that this is the painting of the cat, and more Viagra was found, put two and two together. You're smart. Two days into, over the past week, after an unspecified amount of time after the past few days an indeterminate time after recently after one day after three days ago from one week after some undisclosed time after ten days ago from four weeks ago from two months later from six months ago George White is found missing a face and stabbed 487 times mostly in the neck and dick Four of said stab wounds having been fucked. Photos are found in holes in the body. Last night after two days into over the past week after an unspecified amount of time after the past few days an indiscriminate amount of time after recently after one day after three days ago from one week after some undisclosed time ten days after... Fuck. Sarah Stone and her husband Michael are kidnapped and we see the criminals on their camera. Woo! That's it. There's your summary. I skipped a few things that quite frankly don't fucking matter, so you've missed nothing. We're all on the same page. Let's get into the critique. God fucking damn it.
want to open the floor with the first thing you see at the opening of every single one of these videos, the dog water content warnings. For those of you who follow me on Twitch, I make it a point to highlight these nothing burger content warnings because they don't fucking do anything. Look at these. All eight of these. These are ass. They don't warn you of shit. Graphic, disturbing, violent, distressing. These words could be anything from an on-screen stabbing to just showing us hardcore, hurtcore content. These are empty fucking platitudes. Of course a horror story about a serial killer is going to be graphic, disturbing, violent, or distressing. Are you some kind of fucking idiot? For fuck's sake, in the walls, the episode where a child has their dick ripped off does not have a content warning. Here, let me just- there! They should look like this. This way, your audience can have informed consent to your content. The ones you had are lazy excuses to say that you had them and claim you did your due diligence. Listen, you can say whatever you want about the shit in Boyfriend to Death, for example. At least their fucking content warnings are exhaustive and on the download page, so you have to see them in order to get the game. Visually, they're all inconsistent, too, which considering the premise that these are all tapes made by presumably the same person, wouldn't they be more uniform? I corrected that also. By the way, none of these fucking videos are age restricted. No, you know what? I take that back. Episode 5 is age restricted, but not the one where the child has their dick ripped off or the ones with the bestiality and necrophilia content. No, those ones aren't age restricted. All of the others are, though. Or just 5 is, though. Yeah, it's because of 5 is, though. F 5 is, though. Yeah, sure. Okay, fine. Great. This is another thing, actually. Why are these VHS tapes? The series is billed as analog horror, but there's really nothing analog about it. Are flimsy framing devices that the tapes are found in the basement of some random apartment building? But considering that Slug himself has admitted he doesn't care about the immersion, why bother with this at all? It's clear from both his posts on Reddit and the descriptions of his videos that he doesn't have any affection or care for analog horror's community format or tradition. So why label it that way? It's the same way that the Mandela catalog transitioned out of what we know as analog horror into kind of its own thing. But the difference is that they're the first two words in every title of Urban Spook and Slug isn't even fucking trying and never really was. Analog horror exists for two main facets, far as I can parse. As an evolution of the found footage genre, and to extract and codify the inherent horror of looking back on something and seeing it for the horror that it is, or the horror that inserted itself into your memories. It's why, despite my enjoyment of them, I don't resonate as well with things like Vita Carnis as it comes to analog horror as much as I do something like Gemini Home Entertainment. Gemini leans into imagery and themes of old informational films your science teacher put on in the background that have either been tampered with or that you now have the knowledge to understand are wrong in some way, sometimes both. Vita Carnis should have done something similar to, for example, the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park, a series of singular informationals with maybe the occasional ad. It just doesn't resonate the same. Urban Spook doesn't do even that. It doesn't do either facet well if it bothers to do them at all. I mean, I'm a firm believer in the notion that when it comes to narrative artwork, form follows function. The way you choose to convey the story matters because format can inform why the story is being told this way. Making these descriptions on deviant art instead of videos with film grain changes and affects nothing. Why did you even bother? The conceit we're given up front is that these are VHS tapes that are found in the basement of the uploader's apartment, okay? Why would this info be put on VHS tapes? We're never given a name or a semblance of a clue who the person making these tapes is, but the best I can gather from the context of language and formatting used, it's probably supposed to be a cop? Okay. Well, this information wouldn't have been put on VHS tapes at all, let alone this way. Editing text and images like this onto film is a process, so the police probably would have done these debriefings in person with photos and written blotters, not recorded them like this. And if they did record them, there wouldn't be spooky music added. Did the uploader add that? Why? The whole series is riddled with anachronisms too, and it drives me fucking nuts. A recurring theme is that the killers are caught on camera, but CCTV cameras on the street aren't a thing until the mid-90s into early 2000s, so not exactly in the analog era anymore. And given that Slug doesn't care enough about his story to write any actual characters, it shouldn't surprise you that we don't actually know when or where the story takes place. Yeah, that's right! 
We're never given a location or a time period for this story. Is it rural Minnesota in the 60s? Jersey in the aughts? Hurricane Utah in 1987? I don't fucking know. God forbid we characterize a town where 21 people, three of them cops, for sure died. Yeah, 21 and rising. It was only through some digging I found out the story might take place in Mandeville, Louisiana, and that's only from double-checking the phone number on the YouTube banner. Something the series constantly seems to get praised for as well is its realism, which... Where? This is as realistic as a 2014 creepypasta. Yes, I'm sure there's been no leads. Just like I'm so sure that Bleach smoothed Jeff's skin out despite being what caught him on fire, and despite the fact that Bleach isn't flammable. Now, the number isn't the unrealistic part. The record in the United States is Samuel Little with 60 confirmed kills. No, it's the time frame in which this number is reached. Yeah, Samuel killed 60 people over 35 years. Because of the way these videos are formatted like absolute dog shit, I have no idea how much time has passed in between kills, but language like in episode 8 where it's described as over the past week, these dudes are stacking bodies two to four high, like maybe every other day. This must take place in a major metro area if these dudes aren't caught immediately. These dudes for sure aren't human if they haven't been spotted on the street while climbing up a fucking drain pipe or smashing in someone's back basement windows. Also, who the fuck in a residential neighborhood doesn't hear a cat getting its skin sandpapered off, a woman being excavated with scissors, or a man getting his mouth sewn shut and not call the fucking cops? People in residential areas call the cops for people having a party too loud. Not to mention, by the way, bodies reek. Have you ever smelled something freshly dead? I have. My dad used to hunt. Even the fresh smell of death is unmistakable and strong. The whole house would smell like blood when dad was cleaning fish. I assure you that I would have noticed that, and I'm sure you at home would know what a rotting body smells like. Also, listen, I understand that in the real world, cops are inadequate dipshits who can't be trusted with a sharp stick, let alone guns. But you have to be fucking kidding me at this point. Let's get the obvious out of the way. Why aren't local cops interviewing people who sell art supplies? Checking their cameras. These dudes have fuck tons of paint and canvas, apparently. That would have been one of the first things I'd check. You also expect me to believe that in all these violent crimes, not one victim tried to fight back physically? Police catch people with DNA under their fingernails all the goddamn time. Not to mention, in Pigs, it mentions the mattress is one, covered in blood, two, covered in Viagra, and three, covered in penicillin, right? You know that penicillin is only administered via injection, right? Because it has a short shelf life, and it has to be refrigerated all the time, and you need a fucking prescription to get Viagra, especially shit fuck tons of it, so they'd have to be stealing from some kind of pharmacy. That barn mattress is covered in dead skin, blood, and needles, and nobody checked that. Sure. In episode 8, apparently he fucks the wounds, by the way, and nobody checks that either. They out and out say that there's seminal fluid in the wounds, but I guess nobody checks that for DNA. God fuck. One of my main critiques, actually, after watching the whole series, is that it's shockingly boring as fuck. I mean it. If you take out the shock value that random access gore provides, every episode is incredibly boring despite them clocking it at a top of like three minutes. It's a block of text image, block of text image, block of text image, block of text. Unironically, the same experience as reading text commentaries from 2013. I had three minute videos on two times speed and they were still managing to drag. That's the thing about things like this that are nothing but shock value. When the shock wears off, you have to provide something underneath, or it just gets boring. It's a big issue with 2000's splatter flicks, actually. Nothing but cardboard set pieces leading bodies into a meat grinder. You get bored of watching the same archetypes get turned into paste by nothing but the same cookie-cutter villain over and over. Something similar is actually why I bounced off the current community darling Mandela catalog. Once Alex abandoned the format he'd been using, the atmosphere that kept me was just kind of gone. Everything became really tedious, and I felt like the premise was wearing thin, and I just stopped being invested. I don't know, maybe I don't have enough religious 
trauma. Another urban spook contemporary, Greylock, provides both blood and story for an example of how to do this right. It has a compelling mystery, engaging visual and audio design, and some genuinely incredible acting. So if the gore and body horror wears thin, then the atmosphere and characters keep you present. What I've been given is a kill count video without the charm of James Abe Janice and terrible jokes. And all of that's sort of the main issue, isn't it? The series, when viewed with even the slightest change of angle, is plywood and frame without any sort of real charm. Shake my hand. Come on, boys. Won't you shake a poor sinner's hand? <laughs> yeah. rebuttal to any critique of Urban Spook from its creator and its fans is that they're weak little piss babies who can't handle gore. I want to state my credentials off the top for exactly this reason. So I'm a reader of Mad K, Fire Punch, Tender is the Flesh. In high school, I used to read about Mengele for fun. My favorite creepypasta is the Russian sleep experiment. I listen to the Silent Hill 2 soundtrack and or what amounts to a FNAF jump scare compilation to fall asleep, and I've constantly extolled the virtues of hilarity that is Planet Terror. Do not cite the deep magic to me heretic. I have my limits, everyone does, but I'm not some pearl-clutching Moralton Puritan. I am a certified freak like the rest of you, a card-carrying lunatic, a blood and gore connoisseur, if you will. I will not have my plate mail stomach questioned by edgy 13-year-olds whether they have subscribers or not. The thing that all those other things have that Urban Spook doesn't is simple. A point. I'm gonna use the best example to contrast why the series fails. Mad K, a manga I mentioned earlier, is drawn and written by Ryu Suzuri about a young man named Makoto Tachibana. Makoto summons a demon named Jay into the world at the cost of his soul for the single purpose of killing and eating him. Makoto has always had fantasies about murder and depravity, but doesn't have any real desire to hurt others. Believing that he is inherently beyond saving, he gives his life and future to a creature that he believes is evil so he can indulge in these desires on a thing that either can't die or at least maybe deserves to. Jay, however, is intrigued by this and lures him into deeper, darker depravities. This breaks Makoto's will further because he believes that since his body enjoyed those awful things, that he is further gone than he'd ever known. Jay promises him an escape. Come with him, become a demon. The story from there contains sex, violence, and sexual violence, but never becomes distasteful. Cannibalism is used for the metaphor of having someone truly become a part of you. Brutal, gore-filled sex is a metaphor for destroying intimacy in the name of power and control, and a relationship that's nothing but cruelty and manipulation to show you that abusers and monsters will take your worst traits and convince you that that's all of you. Once in hell, Jay tells Makoto he's a liar. He didn't want to hurt Jay. He was the one who wanted to be hurt. We as the audience know that's not the case. Makoto is afraid of damage. He wants to be in control, to have some agency, some understanding. It's why he made the package in the first place. But Jay convinces him that's what he wanted by violating him and then showing him, see, your body liked it. You're exactly the twisted little masochist I want you to be. He tries to take advantage of that fear and insecurity by allowing him to explore those desires in a way that's cathartic but not healthy. This separates Makoto further from his humanity. Makoto, meanwhile, is doing everything he can not to become like Jay. When Jay gives him the opportunity to have any twisted desire fulfilled, for example, Makoto asks only to be held. He doesn't want to succumb to those desires, the urges of violence and sadism. He wanted to be understood and be helped. Now it's all he can do to fight and scratch to remain as human as he can. Suzuri-sensei uses artful imagery of violence and gore to inform her story and to make themes known and resonant. You could remove those elements from the story and the narrative maybe wouldn't change, but it wouldn't resonate the same. It's gore, it's violence, is intrinsic to the experience trying to be created. It's why Mad K resonates with me where something similar like Has Been Hotel doesn't. For all of its talk of being mature, Has Been just isn't. I've not seen anything handled in a more complex or interesting way than anything on Cartoon Network. Many people I know and respect excuse some of the sentiments and behavior of characters in Has Been the same way I would characters in Mad K, namely with the excuse that it's all set in hell. I can't. The only difference between it and Steven Universe in its construction is sex jokes and cartoon blood. It's childish. It tries to handle serious, fucked up topics, but does so with the same lens as any other Cartoon Network or Nickelodeon show. It's childish in the same way with sex that Urban Spook is with violence. Slug uses extreme, sickening levels of gore like a 13-year-old boy who just discovered Mortal Kombat. Violence needs to serve something in its narrative, whether it's establishing setting, motivation, tone, 
theme. If you have killers in Urban Spook, simply stab each person 666 times instead of the over-the-top cartoonish levels of gore. Nothing changes. It serves. No purpose. The purpose is shock, if it's even that, and that wears thin. It's a jump scare with less effort. I have to provide some sort of tension in a scene for me to get a jump scare out of you. But if I go to the local bookstore and show people images of the Black Dahlia corpses, it'll make them sick, angry, and afraid, sure, but that's it. They don't get anything out of that experience other than a second lunch, and I don't get anything out of that creatively other than a restraining order. Exploiting human suffering for the sake of making people uncomfortable is that. Exploitation. Okay, let me look back at the story and I'm going to demonstrate my point. What does the violence say about the killers? Nothing. There's no pattern to their victims that indicates that they're taking out rage against any kind of particular person. Gender, age, location, method, all of these things are seemingly random. Since the story is supposedly from a third-person perspective, their method and victim patterns are all we have to characterize them. We can only see them through the eyes of a bystander. Real-life serial killers commit their acts in patterns because humans are creatures of habit. We do what's easy and what's cathartic. Not that complicated to figure out. The randomness of it could be something, though, couldn't it? The idea they're just grabbing people at random because of an implicit hatred of life? True. But then why these complex, detailed method? If it was some kind of just general hatred for living things and they just wanted to destroy them, why not just stab random people on the street? Why wouldn't there be more than 21? Nothing about their victims gives us a sense of motive. It's unclear why they're doing what they're doing. For example, alternates hunt humans to replace them, right? Woodcrawlers and Carnis are inhuman monsters following their instincts. Got me? The killers in Urban Spook just brutalize. Even the operator, right? The grandfather of all on fiction. His method served a point. He broke people down to their fundamental level and then either used them as one of his arms into the world or took them away. No, we were never told why he does this because the nature of what it's doing is enough of a clue. It was hunting people, recruiting them, for what we don't know, but its method of breaking someone beforehand told us that it was some kind of priming for whatever fate they met when they were spirited away. The killers in Urban Spook aren't acting out a deep-seated rage, they're not hunting for food, they're not finding companions, they're not satisfying an unseen monster or worshipping an unknown god. They're just... killing. Just to do it. What does the violence say about the victims? Again, Nothing. The victims are never characterized beyond their brutal death, so we never get to know them. Get to see their insights, their feelings, their lives. We don't know what those deaths say about them as people. The only one I can think of is maybe Ian Ford being stuffed into the pig because he was a cop, but then what did giving it Fiona's eyes mean? May being Mr. Hands to death, for example, doesn't say anything about her if we don't know anything about her to begin with. Let's say she was sleeping around, cheating on Ian for years. Well, then it'd be a comment on her adultery. If she was a militant vegan, it could be a sign of her putting animals on the same level as people or a commentary on some kind of hypocrisy. If we knew more about her relationship with her family, maybe it was about her caring more about her animals than her own kids. But we don't know that. We don't know anything. We don't know anything about May or Ian or Fiona or any of the characters that we ever meet because they're not characters. Having the horse rearrange this woman means nothing other than to make the audience squirm from the sexual brutalizing of some random woman at the hands of an animal. Woo. Amazing. Creative. Absolutely fucking thrilling. There's no lifeline for the audience to know the victims. No way for us to know why these people earned these quote-unquote fates. If they're symbolic, we never know. Adding an external sight to have these things presented to the audience via some kind of form of participation would go a long way to investing us in the stories, the characters, and then making the deaths feel more cathartic. But now, they're just there. The most you could say about the violence is that it says something about the setting, but only in that its law enforcement is vestigial at best. It's there because it has to be, not because it does anything. It doesn't do anything but provide us with a meager framing device. The violence doesn't even tell us about the uploader because they don't have a character. The person uploading these videos needs to be there for them to be on YouTube. There's no kayfabe pretending this is someone specific like in Ben Drowned or Pets Cop. The first fucking link in the about section is for merch of the children that are brutalized physically and sexually, by the way, uh, by the t-shirt. All the way down, that's the problem. The violence is grotesque and disturbing for nothing. It's the weird kid in class holding out a dead squirrel by the tail to make the other kids scream. Doesn't mean anything other than the kid might be a serial killer himself. It's all empty shock and spectacle. Nothing more, nothing less. There's nothing to it, there's no point, 
and therefore it doesn't work. For the next stage, a brine is made out of sea salt and plastic laced water. Now something I've noticed from a lot of people in these extreme horror scenes is that they're not good at accepting any form of criticism. They always seem to be immature man babies. I wonder why that might be. Hmm. Well, anyway, Slug is no different. You thought this wasn't gonna be a little commentary? You fool! You idiot! Of course it is! So while I was scripting this, area FBI watchlist topper Wendigoon made a video comparing and contrasting Urban Spook with Greylock, a much better analog horror series. And within a few hours, Slug left a comment on it. I'm gonna show you why this comment is full of enough holes to be diagnosed with Kuru and prove that he's kind of a piece of shit who can't take critique. Wow. I can't wrap my head around the fact that you actually made a video talking about something I created. Even if it's not necessarily in a good light, it's still surreal to me since I've watched your content for some time. Yeah, I just think it's interesting to come across so cordially given some things we'll see later, but yeah, okay. There are some things I really want to clarify. One, I have no idea where you've heard that I don't care about my series, or that I made it only to sell shirts. That is not true. I made the first couple of episodes just for fun, but since it blew up, I really want to improve and try my hand at something new for each episode, like animation or uh, voice acting. Oh, oh, Mimi, uh, I know why he'd think that. Uh, because that's what you said. Yo, I just made this series for fun, mostly to promote my art and music. Immersion isn't really anything I prioritize at the moment. The series is mainly a way for me to promote my art and to come up with fun kills. But there's definitely a deeper story there, too, for the keen-eyed viewer. I can't imagine why he would see something that you posted publicly about only doing the series to promote your artwork. Something you were already selling as merchandise pre-series and then relabeled after the characters had names. And assumed that you were only doing it to promote your artwork. What a wild conclusion to draw! I age-restricted episode 5 myself, since this was around the time I realized that there were a lot of KIDS watching my series. The Painter is intended for an 18-plus audience. I had no idea that so many young people in the community were watching when I started. Oh yeah, that's right. None of these episodes were age-restricted. Let me say it again for the people in the back. The episodes of this series where a woman is raped to death by a horse, a young girl is implied to have been skull-fucked, a corpse's injuries are fucked post-mortem, and a cat is skinned alive and then also fucked are not age-gated. There's two big issues with that. First of all, the fact that all of these extreme depictions of gore were put in a place where you knew children could see, despite claiming this. Uh, you know how I know this is negligence? Because you've admitted it in multiple posts that you know this is 18 plus content, but you've never age gated it. Especially when in some of those posts, you admit you know you're talking to children. I'm gonna choose to give you the benefit of the doubt and assume that those posts were like after you'd age gated five, uh, but that doesn't help you when you know you're talking to kids and the rest of your content's not age gated. Like I've said, the series is aimed for an 18 plus audience. It's very hard to take any advice or criticism from kids seriously. I've also realized that in the quote unquote analog horror community is filled with mostly children. This is something I didn't know since I've never been a part of the community before I made my first video faces, but my series is obviously aimed towards an adult audience and shouldn't be consumed by kids. Yeah, that second part, by the way, is gonna come in handy after a little while, so like, hold on to that. Also, the episode was planned out way before and controversy started. It was not a response to angry people on Twitter. Speaking of, please don't take anything I do on Twitter seriously. A lot of people know me solely from Twitter by now, but I really only use that site to troll. So some of you probably don't know what this is about. Uh, I do, however, um, despite his attempt to delete it. Most people heard about Slug from a particular interaction that he had on Twitter with the horror creator and resident noodle man Postra. He is referring to this tweet. We need to stop praising series that rely entirely on shock value to carry their horror. Stuff like Urban Spook drives me nuts because the only horror in it relies entirely on trying to describe the most vile thing possible with little- Is that too overdramatic? I hope that was too overdramatic. You're such a f 
fucking pussy. Just because extreme horror doesn't fit into your little autistic furry horror taste doesn't mean that there isn't a place for it. Use your platform to talk about things you like instead of shitting on actual creators. Cunt! So let's take this at Slug's word, right? Trolling. Huh? Okay. So what part of this was a joke? Was it the ableism of calling Postra autistic in some form of, like, derogatory term or... Like, the weird assertion of him being a furry. Like, what part of this is a bit, my guy? Um, trick question. It's not. You know how I know it's not? Because I know how to read. So Postra does use his platform to talk about things he likes. In fact, every video of Postra's that I've ever watched has been highlighting something that he enjoys. It's how I found out about Nobody Lives Under the Lighthouse, It Steals, and Five Nights at Treasure Island, by the way. Uh, in fact... I could only find maybe three videos on his channel about things he doesn't like, and even then, they're constructive and helpful. The actual creator's bit is also wrong, because Postra makes his own series, Dreams of an Insomniac. Uh, before you criticize me, by the way, and call me not uh, a content creator or not uh, an actual creator, I make horror content too. They're on this channel. I just thought we'd cut that off at the pass, you know, just, just in case. The final nail in the coffin, how I know it's not trolling, is this post you put up on Reddit. Postra is a rat. This isn't the first time he talked shit. Maybe I went a little hard. I don't know. As I'm sure you're aware, there has been an extreme amount of hate lately. I guess this kinda was the last straw for me. This isn't the first fairly big content creator that basically says I shouldn't have a place in the community simply because I do extreme horror. So it wasn't a troll. You just got ass mad that one of the big boys didn't like your shoddy garbage. Stunned. Flabbergasted. Absolutely fucking smeckledorfed. That's not even a word and I agree with you! I don't really care if anyone hates my work. I'm very aware that it's extreme and provocative. I get the criticism about the writing being shit. Art and music are things I've done my whole life, and they're what I mainly want to put out there with the series. I've never done writing before, and telling a story with deep lore, etc. was never the point. However, there's definitely more to it. There's a bunch of hidden things in the episodes, from one-frame puzzles to clues in the audio design. I even think there's stuff people still haven't found. Seeing the community come together to figure out the name of the painter was really cool. There's more there, even if it's not that deep. And while the presentation is a bit janky, mostly because English isn't my first language, it's one of my favorite aspects of the series. If I ever made a remaster of the series, PLEASE DON'T! I would keep all the spelling mistakes, etc. in. I like the camp. First off, uh, this isn't camp. Like, we can argue semantic definitions of genre till the cows come home, and like, three people in my audience are going to care, so I'm not gonna get into the nuance of it, watch Hazel, uh, but it isn't. Camp is characterized by a low-budget but authentic presentation. Something done in earnest, but not executed the best. There is nothing earnest about Urban Spook. Resident Evil is camp. Birdemic is camp. Fucking Sharknado is camp. Urban Spook is boring and mean-spirited, much like the person who writes it, if I'm being completely candid. Um, uh, so also, here's the thing about amateur writing. True. I can feel this is a first project. I wouldn't rail on it for being that, which is why I haven't. Uh, it's why for all my gripes about the Mandela catalog, I don't hate the thing. It's Alex Kister's first big thing, as you can tell. A lot of choices in execution and design don't work for me, but they work for most of the community, and I can tell that a lot of these things will be sanded out as he progresses. He's a very talented man. However, you refuse to accept critique of it in any way, and then lash out like a child when you don't get your way. Uh, Postra gets an ableist piss baby response for the same critique, but I noticed Iceberg Boy over here gets a nice, well-behaved invertebrate. I wonder why that is. Could it be because his number is bigger and you like him or, you know, I have some thoughts about the way that Wendigoon presents being part of it, considering that you hurled weird dog whistly shit at Postra, you know, the one that's obviously AMAB and like cis straight white man being the one you don't insult. I want to choose to believe it's the bigger number, but, uh, given the context of that other response, we're gonna 
gonna make an assertion. Uh, friendly note, I don't take observation of the obvious as an insult, so you can just be up front and call me the slur, okay? We don't need the dog whistle this time. Autistic isn't an insult for me, uh, I just am. Lastly, hearing you say that I have talent made me really happy. Like I said, I've been enjoying your content for a long time, and I hope that I can create something that you can also enjoy in the future. Rob is a great guy, and I'm so glad to see his project grow. In fact, it might be the first analog horror series I decide to watch, thanks to how you talk about it. Say hi to Papa Meat for me. Much love. Oh yeah, that's right. He admits he's never watched another analog horror series. Uh, that's something he's fairly open about, though. This is something I didn't know, since I've never been a part of the community before I made my first video, Faces. I just think it's interesting that you were never a fan, didn't understand the medium, have never partaken in a central single entry, uh, so I wonder why you would have picked analog horror as your show's an aesthetic. Couldn't be because it's incredibly popular and easy to make if you're a lazy shitheel who wants to sell merchandise. No. No, it's from genuine enjoyment. Like, right now, right? Uh, which is why you're eight episodes in and only now watching your first analog horror series. Despite the fact that this is, like, your magnum opus and you're, like, your first branch into real writing. You'd think you'd have done some research beforehand. It's almost like you didn't give that much of a shit about it. Uh, anyway, uh, that's why you're gonna be distancing yourself from the community post-conclusion of your series, right? I've said it before. I'll keep calling this series Analog Horror, quote-unquote, for consistency. But as soon as it's done, I'm drawing myself away from Analog Horror community. I'll keep making horror content on the channel, though. Interesting. Interesting. Now, I don't want this to be me simply shitting on something I dislike. I like to try and be constructive at the very least, even if it's something shitty with a bad creator. Ever since I was young, I was taught to analyze why things I don't like in a medium I enjoy don't work to make my own content better. So let me explain what I would change if I had to make Urban Spook. <laughs> So, I'm gonna do this in as good faith as I can manage. I'm gonna keep all the plot beats the same. Images, gore, everything. Just assume that those things are the same. Same pictures, same overall gory descriptions. I wanna be fair, all I'm doing is changing framing. I wanna make a point. Here we go. Fundamental opening change. Not making videos. No need for a video format. Straight up doesn't make sense, clashes thematically. We're going for something welcome home and making our own website. But this time, for a fake art gallery. First few posts are normal. Just various surrealist artwork by an unnamed painter. Gallery receives them wrapped up in brown paper placed on their doorstep. Mystery is part of the appeal of their showing, so they're selling. They don't particularly care, especially when it's implied that because the artist is anonymous, they don't have to share the profits with him. Suddenly, a more disturbing piece arrives. Carla's teeth is where it starts, where the pattern begins. The paintings are twisted. They're disturbing. They sell because critics can pretend they understand the deep, tortured meaning, so they're listed on the gallery's online shop page for an outrageous price already sold out. Reviews beneath it, pseudo-intellectual garbage, make no sense. Something close to a meaning, but not really. Sort of just pretending they understand what's going on. We get our first connection. A personal blog that's definitely created by the artist. A discussion of twisted nightmares of pulling out his own teeth, about how satisfying it would feel since he's been grinding his own teeth lately. It's brushed off as an intrusive thought, something that he thinks about idly. He laughs about the absurdity of it, just a mouthful of teeth that he keeps pulling out one by one every time they egg. He talks in other posts about the fact that he submits things to the gallery and online anonymously because he's both a little afraid of the rejection and, admittedly, more afraid of all the attention. A shut-in, a loner, maybe a touch agoraphobic. He was surprised by his popularity, but he cannot handle the newfound attention. No spotlight for him, he just wants his work to be seen. He's happy people like his work. He feels seen. Heard. Our third source. A police blotter. Carla Gray has been murdered. Stabbed 38 times, her teeth removed. No entry, no exit. A newspaper excerpt tells us when her funeral will be. We see a note from a detective about the details. This is where our pattern begins. This continues, sure. Over and over and over. A painting, an entry, a body. A painting, an entry, a body. The painter becomes afraid. His nightmares, his intrusive thoughts, the deepest, darkest thoughts in what we can tell is an unwell mind are slowly being acted out by a force that he cannot command or control. 
It only becomes clearer and clearer with each brutal death that he is seeing through something else's eyes. These nightmares, these intrusive thoughts, are not his own, but that of something else. Brought to these moments by eyes that are not human, so cannot understand the cold destruction that it is wreaking. We see him plead and beg for it to stop at first. His paintings continue to sell. Their ties to a suspicious murder make them valuable and sought after. It's genius, they say. A man interprets the horror around him to make the layman see and confront the terror. The artist is outed, found out by the police via his fingerprints on the paintings. He's cleared. He has an alibi. He was never there. But his way of always seeming to know draws more attention, more comments, more viewers can comment. They can sway the artist's tone. They can agree that his work is transcendent. His entries become more egotistical, more narcissistic. That of course only he understands that his will and desires are so powerful that they're carving a bloody swath through the neighborhood. That his pain is recognized. That his fear may be taking innocent lives. But that's what they deserve. To be a part of his art is the highest honor, of course. For them to die so that others can understand him is all that matters. Should those comments turn on him, though, they become heretics. People who don't understand his torment. He is an unwilling victim, beholden to the creature he is seeing and hearing, who is getting closer, more brutal, more violent, whose eyes are becoming sharper and beginning to enjoy the pain. He's afraid. He's letting out that fear in the only way he can, lashing out, and he is innocent. It's not his fault that people like his work. It's not his fault that he was chosen to be this thing's vessel. It's not his fault that any of this is happening. He's letting out his own feelings the only way he knows how. So why can we not understand him the way they do? Why does he have to suffer alone? It's not fair. We see every victim's story laid out. Obituaries, emails from work, family text, outcries in the community, the fear and heartache of this small town are being laid out for us via that third unbiased site. We see the police's rising tension, the irritation at being ineffectual, the general public's terror to even leave their homes. This small town in Louisiana is getting smaller and smaller by the day, people becoming more and more afraid. But we can see these details presented to us, giving us a picture of who suffers and who dies for the painter's suffering to finally be understood. Something he feels entitled to, regardless of how the town shrinks around him. The story I'd create does these things to touch on themes of entitlement, of isolation, of misunderstanding, of loneliness. It discusses themes of how the art community glamorizes the mental illness of the artist, only encouraging that suffering to continue, exacerbate, and get worse. Van Gogh is famous for losing an ear, after all. How art can turn from well-meaning expression into the exploitation of others in the pursuit of money and fame. How it doesn't matter if you hurt others as long as your art reigns out. How caring only for what others around you think, as opposed to how those things make you feel, destroys your mind and your relationships with others, making your art stagnate, become cruel, and become indifferent. I don't know. Seemed poignant to me. Ultimately, it's kind of a shame. I hate to see this kind of thing. I always want to see someone skilled in our field do something new and interesting. I'd rather something sharp and new. I love checking out new projects from smaller creators purely because it means that they could be doing something I've never fucking seen before. It's why I love things like Valle Verde, the Sophie series, Greylock. New creators I've never heard of doing incredible things with a really cool medium. But, you know, I always want to give something the benefit of the doubt, but I can't extend it to Urban Spook. It's just not that. It's mean-spirited, cruel, disgusting, boring, stale, and its creator is a fucking man-child that can't take the slightest bit of criticism. I want to see the scene stay good and get better. I've also talked over and over about the responsibility that we as creators of the terrifying have when we're holding the nightmares of our audience in our hands. It all keeps coming back to the quote I read at the beginning. Fear and revulsion aren't the same thing. Only a hack would confuse the two. Let's hope instead of the brutality of a hatchet, our artist here learns how to use a palette knife. I think his art would benefit from the change of tools, to be honest. See you in the next one! <sighs> Goodbye.